Welcome to Book Reviews Kill, a podcast about fantasy, science fiction, and horror novels. I'm Evan. And I'm Chad. And today we're sitting down with Jason Pargin, former executive editor for Crack.com and author of the John and Dave and Zoe Ash series. Jason, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Thanks for having me. To pull back the curtain a little bit, we are recording this on a Zoom and I actually rarely have my camera on. And I've set this up so that I can really only see myself so I can track how much I'm touching my face. Um, <laughs> because ideally, the way the software is supposed to work is that you can see other people and so you can take from their facial cues like when they're trying to talk or when they they want to interject. That's the whole benefit of humans being able to see each other when they talk. Uh, no, I'm only watching myself because I really do fear that if I don't... Uh, I'm going to pick my nose or something because I, because I'm one of those people who has to be constantly touching my face at all times. I, I don't know. I don't know why it's a nervous habit. I, I feel you. I had to stop myself from having my face on camera because I would just, I would just feel like insecure about it, you know? So I'd kept it really look like, how's my hair? And then I wasn't focusing on the conversation. So I was like, I'm tiny Chad now up in the corner. For I love example, the way I look. <laughs> I know. Just gorgeous. Having watched other streams before and watched chat on other streams in my life, I know for a fact certain people who are seeing the video, because I think you're thinking about posting the video version of this on YouTube, possibly. Um, and if so, I know for a fact there is a certain segment of the audience that is studying very hard to try to find out what brand of headphones I'm wearing. <laughs> right? Because people are super into that. And they're if they look long enough and hard enough if they google it they're eventually going to realize i'm wearing the sony headphones wired headphones they sell at target for 9.99 great headphones <laughs> they're $10. They look sleek i've bought so many pairs of those headphones um it, because i don't trust wireless technology because i'm extremely old i'm afraid that i will get in the middle of a podcast and the, the battery will die and wired headphones are so cheap and so unwanted by the rest of uh, of the customers <laughs> that they're in like this bargain bin they're like dusty with all the other stuff nobody wanted so it, anyway usually it takes much further into the podcast before i totally derail it with something like that so we we got going early this time so i into it uh, and i've got i've now found an object on my desk i can hold in my hand and i think if i fidget with that i will not touch my face oh, I, I play with my uh my cord for my headphones and i would did not make it very far into before interrupting you which is going to happen so many times so i apologize in advance uh jason we are so excited to have you on thank you for coming how are you doing i'm doing great and as we were <laughs> as we were getting our zoom and all that stuff set up a story came across twitter that is one of the weirdest things having to do with books i've ever heard so there is a movie in production that is a $200, $200 million blockbuster called Argyle that stars Brian Cranston, Henry Cavill, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, Dua Lipa in her first role. And this is going to be streaming, I guess, on Apple uh, Plus or what's the name of Apple streaming service? I think it's Apple Plus. It's Apple Plus. Yeah. It is based on a novel by a first time writer. The problem is uh hollywood reporters looked into it they cannot find any evidence that this book exists or that the author exists <laughs> what <laughs> they tried to ask for a preview copy they were not given one there is no amazon listings for this book no one seems to have a copy of it they reached out to the publicist to try to get access to the author they can't find a listing for the author anywhere under a pseudonym or otherwise. Their social medias are vacant and appear to have just been set up and they have no followers. And there is no evidence that the what? book they're based this movie on is a thing, even though they've promoted it as this uh, Ellie Conway, this first time author, has secured this massive getting your first book turned into a $200 million movie with an all star cast. Uh, it's rare. And that's a story. That's why they obviously want to talk to this person. Like, how did this happen? People in our business, like, this is the the thing everybody wants to know. How? How did you do it? Are you the offspring of a famous producer? And um, no evidence that they can't find the book, can't find the author. Wow. This wow. is. I wonder if it's, do you think it's like a marketing stunt or are they just really secretive or cause <laughs> some sort of source material had to exist, right? I mean. They're like, we'll get, a, we'll get, we'll capitalize on the book community. It's like, yeah, well, the book community is going to want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, point. here's that. That's the thing because I'm imagining 
like from Apple or the studio's point of view, whoever, um, because the deal was with Apple, but I don't know what studios shooting it. But there, the idea that the average movie watching person won't care that it has Henry Cavill in it or Dua Lipa or any of these other famous people, but that they would watch it because, well, you know, I heard it's based on a novel from a first time author. Someone who has been an author for a long time, nobody cares. No, no, no one in the world, not even people who, not even your family cares. It's like that. It, so you're saying, well, did they maybe make that up? It's like a marketing angle, maybe. But people aren't if, researching that. Yeah. If so, it's like nobody's gonna nobody's gonna buy in if they didn't already have an Apple subscription or if they have it and they had to like pay extra for the rental of this movie. Nobody's gonna do that based on this weird story of they invented a fake author and a fake book gatherer because it's not like. Oh, it's based on a book. It's not like that's a selling point for people watching blockbuster spy action thrillers. It actually yeah. makes me less likely to watch a movie. Like who wants right. to read, you know, who wants to watch a movie based on some boring book somebody wrote? Uh, but anyway, I bring it up on this podcast, not just because it's the last thing I looked at and that's all the further my attention span goes back, but also because that's kind of what we do for a living, like the network of, you know, getting news of books out there and doing interviews and and the, the world of like authors trying to get word out on their books, because we live in a world in which we're all drowning in free media and no one wants to read a book. And so here's this thing where they're either pretending a brand new author got this blockbuster movie made. Or a brand new author did get this blockbuster movie made, but that this author is trying to avoid all media, all social media, totally out of the public eye. In which case, how do they get this deal done? Yeah, it's kind of a weird paradox there. Yeah, yeah. something doesn't make sense there. Maybe it was the maybe he also invented Bitcoin. So just <laughs> running from the people, you know? <laughs> so, uh, damn it, that book got uncovered. <laughs> now they're going to know my terrible secret. That's really funny. Damn. Uh, yeah. and, a, and a very short-sighted marketing stunt, if it is one. I mean, uh, it seems like it's a really anticipated movie already. You got Henry Cavill in it. I mean, I'll watch anything with that big tree in it, you know? Big giant tree. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask real quick about your writing process. We have some uh, listeners on here that are budding writers, myself included. And I'm always curious to ask authors that have put out some really excellent books uh, do you outline these books or do you just kind of have a general direction of where they're going and you just kind of set off and do heavy revisions or what's what's the process like for these? I do outline. I've been told most authors don't, though. It, it's I would never try to generally any advice about process. I tried to never put it out there as this is like a uh, holy writ because you you've probably seen writing tips like that oh, where yeah, it, it's like you know whoever says you know you should get up and write at 5 a.m that's when your mind is freshest or mm -hmm. whatever everybody's different everybody's brain is different everybody has a different process for me i i outline heavily before i start writing because to me otherwise it's like trying to build a house without a blueprint you're going to waste a ton of effort right building and only to realize oh this doesn't work you know we didn't it's like no i gotta know down to the exact detail that this doesn't create conflict that this works this makes sense that you know that everything everything that has to fit to get together character plot setting themes all that stuff i've got a big whiteboard just out of you in this room i'm in where i actually draw out in uh flow chart form mm, cool uh, uh, yeah, and like, uh, so it's not just I'm not just drawing out uh, plot events, but uh, story arcs, character arcs, you know, how this character interacts with this and, and all that, because I couldn't keep track of it all in my head if I didn't. But also when I sat down to when I sat down to write it, having the confidence, like the, people talk about the fear of sitting down and staring at a blank page. That's where, you know, writer's block comes in is that you're just you freeze up because it's like, oh, my gosh, where would you start? Well, I've already started. I've got the blueprint. I know exactly what I need. I need this scene, this scene, this scene. And even better for someone who is severely attention, short attention span person like myself, if I want to hop ahead and write some scene I'm more excited about that comes later in the book, I can do it. Right. Because I know based on the outline that that is going to come, I know, I know I'm going to need that scene. By the time I, I write my way there, it may be slightly different. I may have made some decision about tweaked who's in the scene or what they say, 
but that's a minor rewrite. The meat of it is is down. And so for me, since the primary hurdle of writing is to convince yourself to actually write, <laughs> like in whatever means you have to do it, that's what gets me writing. I, I love the act of outlining because you don't have to, you can only worry about the broad strokes. You don't have to get bogged down in the language and the actual tedium of typing it one word at a time. Um, and, and then once I have that, it's much easier to do the other part. But again, other very, very famous authors never outline and will tell you never to outline. These are people way more successful than me. George R. R. Martin does not outline, and he's writing books a hundred times more complicated than anything I could ever write. Um, and he's had no problem with it whatsoever. His books come out right on schedule. Exactly. Uh, we want them. No, with no issues. Uh, but no, it, but it's but that is, I think, part of his what makes his life difficult is that he's he's like, no, I will put the characters into place and just let them play it out like pieces on a board and see what they do. And then they'll surprise me. And it's like, well, yeah, that's that would give me a panic attack if I, if I found out <laughs> that my whole that my whole uh, plan for the last half of the book got derailed because one of my characters surprised me and committed suicide Ooh. four chapters. And it's like, oh, because uh, the entire or the entire climax, the entire way this is supposed to play out just involved that guy and he's now dead. So anyway, and again, it wants just to be clear, in case somebody asks, well, do you feel like restrained or whatever by your outline? You can adjust it. Right. But the point is that you're adjusting the outline. It's not a case where you've written three quarters of the book and then decided this isn't working. This isn't working. Because I feel like I don't know what percentage of novels in the universe that get started actually get finished, but it's got to be tiny, right? Right. Like for every completed novel, there's got to be hundreds, if not thousands, where somebody sat down and started it. And so many of those people who wrote for two, three straight years and then eventually just petered out and then it got stuck in a drawer somewhere um, or in, in somewhere on your laptop. I don't know if people still physically type them out and put them in a drawer. But uh, the ones that die in the vine, it's because somewhere in the course of telling the story, they just weren't themselves into it anymore and that's because they wrote themselves into a place where they no longer found that interesting and didn't the thought of having to go back and fix it uh is just Daunting. too much it, yeah and, and it'd be like if you were remodeling a kitchen and then you realized after you had already put a bunch of stuff in that you no longer liked you know the wall behind the stuff and it's like well the only way to fix it is to rip all that stuff out again and so your answer is you just stop remodeling altogether and just leave <laughs> it like that so that that's part of what the outline does for me is it is like insurance against that happening because any conflicts any low points any boring parts it becomes clear in the outline like you can tell looking at it it's like so there's going to be like five straight chapters of just these two people talking and you know on their patio it's like, that's not going to work. Yeah. And so you can adjust it there instead of finding yourself having put 200 hours into writing that scene only then to realize nobody's going to want to read this. This is just people talking. Yeah, it really right. shines through in the books that you're writing. I mean, I, I just fly through this stuff. I mean, oh, thank you. Yeah, like the, the dialogue is snappy. Um, you never really know what to expect at all. And things really, there's a, there's a really good pace to, especially like these, the John and Dave, David books. You know, and you're writing a genre which uh, I'm going to go out on, on a limb and call it uh, cosmic horror, um, with a with an edge of humor to it. You know, there's some existential horror there, and interdimensional horror, and things like that. That kind of aesthetic and that genre really has the the sky's the limit. Like I I literally have no clue what's going to happen next because. You know, if we're working in multiple infinite universes, anything could happen. You know, so, like, so many things. So it's, it's really good. I call it the shaking of the snow globe. And like when an author just shakes that snow globe and this story goes crazy, uh, it's one of my favorite things. And I respect an author that can do that well. And you, my friend, shake your snow globe. It's not even a snow globe. <laughs> yeah. Multiple parts of a snow globe in different dimensions. Okay. So I want to know the birth of John dies in the series. Like, how did this come about? Where you, you have a dream? Was it a Lovecraftian sort of experience, or did you write these characters around people that you know? How did this story come to being? So this story is kind of uh, the stuff of legend among my the small niche that is my my fans. 
Um, but what happened was because I was I got started writing when the internet was invented. I started blogging in like 1997. So this would have been a time and only like 30% of the households in the United States had an internet connection. That's how long ago it was. So I had a website that years later, people would call it a blog. That word also did not exist. This is pre-blog. This is pre-social media. This is pre everything. The internet was just Modern a series world. Of, of these pages where it was mostly uh, just the nerdiest people you knew mm-hmm. writing whatever thought popped into their head. So I had a a blog that this started to gain a little bit of a, a following in the late 90s, you know, 98, 99. And then its format was, as was true of the internet at the time, just whatever the hell I felt like doing. There, there were like fake interviews and there were movie reviews and uh, there, there were poems. That it was just, it had no format because again, there was no template for what a website was supposed to be. Yeah, This was back when if you typed in, uh, you know, Disney.com, it was like uh, they didn't have a website. It, wow. it, you know, giant corporations didn't have websites yet. They didn't know what they were. You couldn't buy things online. That didn't exist. This was all brand new. It was just text, a, a few photos. Photos took like three minutes to load. So you, you, you try to not put too many photos on that. Yeah. And you maybe have like a little spinning like skull uh, uh, Jeff uh, on your on your front page, something like that. Um, so as part of that, the format of the site was similar to the format of these books. And the, a lot of the articles started as steaming very straightforward. And then as you read it, you realize it, it just went crazier and crazier. So I said there were interviews. I never actually talked to these people. But the interview for the first quarter of it seemed very straightforward. And then their answers just started to get more and more strange and eldritch as it went. And then as the reader, you know, because again, this is early enough in the internet and that the concept of saying something that wasn't true on the internet was also brand new and novel. And the reader would eventually realize, oh, this is this is this crazy person has just made all, all this up. Or I had the site had a, a section for recipes, and the recipes would have ingredients that are like nonsense words, but it would never make it clear what that thing is as it described what to do with it in the recipe. And you would start to puzzle through it. And the whole idea was just to confuse people. Because again, back in those days, the idea of going on the internet and then being delightfully confused by something, that was like as good as it as it got. It, not even the porn had come along yet. <laughs> not even the so, porn. Not yeah, this is... The por- I do remember as a child those slow loading pictures, though. You're like, come on. Uh, yeah. In uh, October of, I think, 2000, for Halloween, uh, I had, as, as it was supposed to be like, a, it, well, it's Halloween, it's spooky season. So let's do a, sh- hor- a short horror story. And it was the same format of the other nonsense on the website, which is it starts with what looks like a very standard uh, ghost story where it's this woman who comes to this, these two, these two guys, these two 20 something losers in their apartment. And this woman comes and says, I think I've got a ghost in my house. Can you just come and look at it? I've heard through word of mouth that you can maybe help me. And so it, from that extremely simple setup, it they go there and it just goes completely off the rails. The story just gets, stupider and stupider until <laughs> this this sort of poltergeist in her house winds up possessing a bunch of meat that she had in her freezer and chasing them around and then the way they defeat it is they find that they they're familiar with another more famous ghost hunter so they just get they call him up and get him on the phone with the with the monster and he resolves it somehow <laughs> off camera like we don't hear what he does and then so then, then they just all go back home so it was just this very simple joke that it, it started out as like, oh, I'm going to tell you a really creepy ghost story. And then it just goes completely off the rails. And the people who were fans of the work knew like that rhythm of this is how we're, we're doing it. They are familiar with and, and people liked it. So the following Halloween, as we got into the fall leading up to holiday, people started saying, oh, I can't wait for this year's ghost story. Which is how I found out that there was supposed to be another one that year. (laughs) 
So I sat down and spent, you know, a few weeks writing another adventure that picked up from the last one about these two guys. Um, and then, but it deepens the lore into a lot of things that just I found interesting. I, you know, big fan of, of cosmic horror and all of, and all of that stuff. Uh, and then it started to fill in the backstory a little bit about why they can do what they do, why there's someone who would actually be able to help you if you had a problem like this, um, how, how bad they are at it. Um, but they're kind of do it because they're thrust into it. They're not, they didn't choose it. It's just an ability they have, but they're thoroughly incompetent at it. it introduced Amy into the story. And so it became this thing where every year it was taking up more and more of the site and it kind of went viral again at a time before that word existed. That was later in the internet's existence. People would start referring to popular things as having gone viral, but it, it grew an audience on this website where I was still just doing, uh, you know, essays and columns and, and stuff like that. But um, it was something where it just grew kind of, I was posting it as, as it went and it took about five years before I had a novel length story. Wow. So the process, like you're referring to, like, how did this, this come to me? It, it's more just a reflection of what I'm interested in, but also all of the, the spin I kind of tried to put on it where because this text is not on paper and no one paid for copies of it, I had the ability to go back and edit mm. the previous year's editions as I went. Oh. And I did that a lot. To so make the this, world compatible. Uh, yeah. Well, and just to, like I would do a, a, a payoff and then drop in setup or drop in foreshadowing, totally cheating, but it was something I posted for free on the internet. Yeah, like, what, what are you going to do about yeah. it? Um, so, but the nature of the story is reflecting that, that format and the nature of the technology, because the way what you like about it and what the fans of the series want, like about it, where it is this extremely convoluted, ridiculous and extremely stupid, but also incredibly complicated clockwork plot of chaos. callbacks and and yeah and it's chaos but it's it's setups and payoffs in that whatever you saw on the opening pages of the novel that you wherever you think it's going to go like the new one that's coming out you know it starts off with something that's a plot you've seen many many times where somebody's like well i've got a toy it's acting weird i think my this toy is haunted it starts there and then where it winds up is just several thousand miles away from where like they've left that so far behind um and that is a result of me writing on the internet for an audience that at any moment could easily go do something else because it's they're on, they're already on their computer where the internet is yeah. So it's not like I'm trying to give them a book that they read instead of being online. It's like I'm writing this knowing and that as the technology improves, like, you know, the version came out in 2005. It's like these people are one click away from porn. Like I am trying to <laughs> get them from the porn that's on the, the machine they're using to write the story. So the, the kind of hyperactive nature where every sentence has – something at it has a joke has an observation has something it moves at this crazy speed because i was writing it at the time knowing my readers if i bore them for 30 seconds they're gone yeah wow um, and the hook constantly it's, yeah that's really yeah. interesting so it's not that i i don't i've never felt like um you know i'm i'm, I'm some master of suspense or anything like that <laughs> it's that this was the first fiction I'd, I'd ever written. I had written some short stories in college for classes, but in terms of I'd never written a novel before, I was not a I was not a fiction writer. I, I just wasn't my thing, um, and kind of fell into it. But it was written in the context of this website of this stream of consciousness blog, and then it just as I kept sharpening it and polishing it, I think I accidentally made something unique. But it's unique not because I'm I'm some kind of a genius. It's unique because the way I was writing it, the audience I was writing for, the technology being new, the fact that I have an extremely short attention span myself, and that I knew I had to keep things moving. And, and you want to, for example, I had a message board. So I had fans who would discuss, like a lot of my traffic was the fans discussing the thing I had just written, whatever it was. 
So giving people stuff to talk about and chew on, and there's little hidden, you know, Easter eggs and things like that, you know, and, and it's it's packed with little things for you to notice that the protagonist and the narrator didn't notice. Like there's entire sections of the plot that come and go, they're in the book, but the guy telling the story didn't pick up on it. And it's left for you, the reader, to pick up on it. And that was in those days it was like, oh, they'll catch that on the message board. That'll be something fun for them to realize mm -hmm. that he actually missed what was going on, that we, the readers, did. Well, out of that context, I think people, it's just something like, oh, this is very clever. And this book, you know, the, the book is, the, the plot is smarter than the narrator because the na narrator is kind of dumb. But <laughs> so you're, you're seeing a complicated plot that is being conveyed to you by somebody who doesn't understand it that you can understand it all the information is there well that all relates back to where you know the the soil from which this this grew from was the late 90s internet culture wow that's uh that is really a unique situation for a book and explains a lot about how readable all of this is that's really really cool i really enjoy the characters john david and amy um you know as you said like they they do have kind of this less than capable streak to them, which is really endearing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is how three people in their twenties would deal with this kind of stuff. They don't have all the information. They're they're trying their best. And they've got pretty good intentions, but or at least uh, I feel like David and Amy do. <laughs> um, but <laughs> if you could meet John, David, and Amy and sit down with them, what would be the first thing that you would say to them collectively? Uh, I think we wouldn't get along very well <laughs> is the big thing um because people people assume that because it's told first person and to to, to fully build out the extended universe of the jason Parsons writing uh this the character of dave was a fictional character created for the website like the columns and stuff were written by him telling a story and a, about his life that is very different from the one i lead it's it's written mm. first person but it's it's not you it's it's fake it, it's the way a, a lot of people you know listen to uh, like old gangster rap and assume that those rappers actually committed those crimes it's like well no they're not a lot of these guys are just musicians that's just the format of the music it's first person but they're they're telling first person crime stories. They're not reporting to something they actually did, or else they would be in, in jail if they had done those things. So you had a the character of, of David is this very cynical, often drunk, not very productive member of society who lives in this small broken town. And real life me, like I don't drink alcohol. I I mm -hmm. I, I never have. I, I'm not. Uh, I don't have his attitude toward the world. I, I've I've always been a relentless worker. I've had a job since I was like 16. Well, that's the opposite of everything. Yeah. But that was the fun of the website because I, I assume no one could ever think that David was a real person or that his friend John was a real person because these, these are people that could not function. They could not exist in society. <laughs> but it, it was in terms of the nature of the, the threat they were facing in the story they're these the, these characters it was all custom made for them because the whole idea is they're facing something that is beyond their understanding and beyond any human understanding of all the possible humans to have to attempt to <laughs> to, to to interact with something that is beyond their understanding <laughs> these are like the, the three worst people you would you would want to try to do that and the people unfamiliar with the story, you've got in the three the three primary characters, you have basically the three fundamental ways that people deal with the unknown, which is David simply is just annoyed by it and yeah. wants to go back <laughs> home. He just he has doesn't want anything to do with it. He doesn't find it interesting or fascinating. He doesn't want to be bothered. John is the exact opposite. He's one of those people who just is always eager for some new experience. He will try any new drug, any new food, any new anything you hand him. He will try it. He just wants to experience things. And he will plunge ahead with no plan and, and just oh, has that confidence of of the of a kid who is like emotionally stunted, but also, you know, is like very eager. So the back and forth between him and David is the core comedy of the early parts of the stories. 
is this completely different worldview, but equally dysfunctional, because that also is not a good way to to live your life. And then they, partway through the book, they encounter Amy, who is a young woman who is a genius, but also incredibly sheltered. Like she's never, she's at that point that you meet her, she barely leaves the house. Um, and she's got this tragic past, but she also is extremely analytical. And, but, and she also, unlike the two of them, is just extremely positive about the world. She, she sees right. the best in people. So among the three, you have like, three very flawed lenses through which you would try to examine a, a threat that is unknown or that is otherworldly um, or to really to solve any problem at all. But the joke of the books is that if you put these three extremely flawed people together, you almost have like one functional person. <laughs> um, and so you're watching them try to kind of clumsily stumble through that as as things keep getting weirder, weirder, and weirder. And just for anyone listening here, if you haven't read these books, we're talking a lot about the comedy of them, and they're definitely, fu- I mean, they're some of the funniest books that I've ever read. I have was openly laughing out loud multiple times, but they also, also. are, <laughs> but also, man, they are interlaced with all sorts of other things. Like, this isn't really a spoiler, because I don't think, if you haven't read the book, it won't give anything away, but the tunnel scene in, I think it's the second book where they're escaping you know what i'm talking about yeah tunnels yeah oh my gosh i I, it still haunts me (laughs) like it is so horrific i had to stop reading i was like okay okay we're gonna take a break now so these books are a lot more than just a fun romp you will notice and the i feel i feel like people hate when you talk about like the marketing of the book like i'm sitting here with uh with like my spreadsheets it's like what's the per- what's the proper marketing because no author thinks that way and if they do they're probably not a very good author right but you will notice when i talk about the books when we market the books they really de-emphasize the humor because i think a shockingly large number of readers if you tell them oh the book is so funny it's so funny it's like oh well this is just a waste of my time it's just mm. it's like oh it's going to be this wacky because bad horror it can still be pretty good. Bad drama can be, can be boring. Bad comedy Ugh. is a nightmare. Yeah, a like nightmare. there's nothing fun about bad comedy. And so, if you promise it's a comedy, it's like, oh, it's, it's hilarious. You're gonna love it. You'd be shocked by how many people immediately run the other direction. So, we, hmm. we usually emphasize. No, it is. We we have you know. I I make this. I grew up as a horror fan. I grew. I was reading Stephen King when I was you know nine years old. It, everything about drawing out suspense and monster design, all that stuff. I take it very very seriously. The comedy is in the fact that you're you're reading this. All of this truly horrible stuff happening through the eyes of a narrator who has the worst possible reaction to it in terms of like his, what, like the things that should scare him don't, but the things that he does dread, it's like having, having to have a conversation with somebody like that worries him much more than whatever this monster thing is, which he largely sees as, as an inconvenience. Um, And that's part of the, the running bit is people like hire them to solve their whatever their their supernatural problems in some way but it is never ever 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 a case where they come in and do something you've seen before where they'll do an exorcism or if it's a monster there's like a rule in the books that they never defeat a monster by like shooting it with a gun they may shoot it with a gun a lot of times it never works right um and because and so in many cases they'll show up and somebody's like oh yeah like the cabinets in my house the cabinets in my kitchen open and close themselves spontaneously in the middle of the night and like at one point uh you know a cup rose up and flew across the, the room and you know and broke itself and their advice would be like well can you can you just do, like put rubber bands or something on the knobs <laughs> of the cabinets to keep them closed like if that's the only issue then what really like, why is it any different than if you had like an unruly cat in your house? Like, like, why is it such a big deal that it happens to be a ghost doing it versus if as if it was just a problem with the hinges on the cabinets? It's like, why are you? Because David truly is not interested in that. He, he really doesn't care. He's not curious about anything. 
thing. So it is carefully crafted into the horror that you as the reader, there's times when it's like, he really should be looking into this more. <laughs> oh, so many times. And he just isn't interested. So th- there's information that you are picking up as the reader because he's coming across it and it's clear what's happening. But he, your narrator, and you're you're trapped for the most of the books, you're trapped in his point of view. And, and he doesn't get it because he doesn't care. He just wants this to be over because he wants to, to go back home. Uh, and that's something that I borrowed. I, you know, I, I didn't invent that. That's, that's, I grew up reading Douglas Adams hitchhiker's guide books and having the narrator, Arthur Dent go on this wild space adventure. And the whole time he just wants to go back home and, and have tea. <laughs> it, it, like that's, that's great. Tea. It's like such endless comedy from the reluctant narrator who it, at no point is his reaction, what it should be or, or what, you you would hope it would be you know for someone who's supposed to be the protagonist i read somewhere once that if when you're writing if you're if you're trying to be funny you better make sure it's really funny mm-hmm. like if it, it better be really funny because if something fo- like like you said you know so a lot of things can fall a little flat and we can keep going but humor has to stick the landing well it's like if you meet somebody at a party if like if somebody's introducing you to their new friend and they're like, oh, this is Evan. Oh my gosh, he's hilarious. He's hilarious. Say hi, Evan. You'd be furious Hello. because it's like, I can't live up to that. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, say something funny. Say something funny. It's like, Wait, no, what? I don't. That's not, that's how, not how humor works. works. That's not how it works. Um, so <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's the same thing. I'm glad people find them. But even if you have no sense of humor at all, I actually think you could still enjoy the books. Because in that case, it, it's just tense the fact that these guys are so bad at their jobs yeah. and that you're watching them struggle against their own. It's not just incompetence. It's they, they are in a situation where they're in their twenties and realize we've not been trained to do anything useful. Like they both have a ton of, of like pop culture knowledge in their head. <laughs> and like John has a ton of, a ton of skills. He can play the guitar and he can do like card tricks and all sorts, but none of it helps him in any way it's like he's not turned it into a a, a living so it's it's not it's not symbolic of the way a lot of people in their 20s find themselves in the world in the adult world it's just literal that's the way it is a lot of us a lot of us get spat out into the world realizing oh i've i've been to college i have all of this debt uh and i've learned nothing i don't know how to do any of this i don't know how to change a tire on a car well, it's really endearing to watch people kind of get by on the skin of their teeth, you know? I mean, there is something about that that you want to keep reading about is these people that are just, they're, they're, they're just competent enough to like not die, you know? And, Barely. And yeah, like, and that's, that's something that's really attractive in, in a character is, you know, kind of like Arthur Dent, he's kind of stumbling his way to the top. He's kind of getting through this you know, somewhat accidentally, somewhat because he is a clever person. I mean, like, you can't say John isn't clever or that David isn't clever or that Amy isn't clever. It's like, but they're just, they're, they're, they're just making it. And that is really fun to read. It adds to the suspense and the tension and everything and makes it relatable at the same time. So yeah, you really struck gold with these, with these three characters. They have a type of intelligence that doesn't help them. For the most part, <laughs> but so, but the, that's kind of the fun part is you're watching them try to like train themselves on the fly because obviously there's no class for dealing with the things they're dealing with that they can take. There's no college degree for it, but that's kind of symbolic for how a lot of us feel like, you know, you sit down to do your taxes. It's like, well, why didn't I have a class on this? Or, or why didn't I learn how to do a job interview? Like all these things that my life depends on. You know, I'm trying to buy a house. Why did nobody teach me how this works? Why did nobody tell me like how to keep my my credit report? Why is it for me to learn how to do any basic thing around the house? I have to watch like a YouTube tutorial. Um, and these guys are kind of in that position only without the ability to go look things up on YouTube. It's like they're having, they can learn things quickly. They can adapt. And then obviously they are still the protagonist. There's a point where David does the right thing reluctantly eventually <laughs> after he exhausts all other options but that's that in the end is part of what you find hopefully if we've done it right that's part of what you find affecting about it because you realize oh he 
he didn't want to be there, but he's there anyway. Like he showed right. up in the end and he complained the whole time, but he was there. I think the introduction of the Amy character really helped a lot too. Um, kind of bring his endearing side to the forefront because he cares about her so much. Um, you know, he has such a low opinion of everyone, including himself and kind of has a cynicism filter that he sees the world through. Excuse me, David, I'm talking about David, not John. Amy, and his affection towards her really kind of brings forth his um, like cute, like endearingness. Like where we can kind of become emotionally attached to him. I love how you say that they uh, become prepared. Like they try to learn and adapt to the situations. And it's so true, but their adaptions are ridiculous. You know, he readied the shotgun, making sure that both bayonets were firmly attached. Like, Cause <laughs> he had one fall off. So he decided two or something ridiculous, you know, like there was logic there. Uh, he tried, but <laughs> also with Amy, the fact that when he first meets her, he's instantly dismissive of her as he is of, of everyone. And you have to see over the course of the book, like even his physical description of her changes radically because you're seeing it through his eyes. And, and as she was just one more obnoxious person he has to deal with, but whatever he feels toward her, it, it, it has to come, it has to get filtered through this absolute brick wall. That is his, his cynicism. And then also if you, hopefully you read the book or if you read it a second time, you realize that she instantly saw through him. Um, and he doesn't know it, but she instantly sees that this is an an act, or that this is something he has he does as a defense mechanism. Self defense, yeah. Um, but it's you know it's one of those things where it, it's it's a layer of nuance that it seems nuanced to me. Other people maybe saw it instantly, but it's it's all filtered through his eyes. So you see how clueless he is about taking cues and hints from people through his interaction with, with her. And then it, it's eventually uh, comes around, but it doesn't happen easily. So you and I connected on TikTok. Uh, I was really excited to get a message from you. TikTok is a wonderful, weird, vast place. How has your experience been on there in regards to promoting your stuff, promoting yourself, uh, interacting with other creators? What's it been like for you? So this is kind of, it's not a, a sore point. It is a it is a a source of tremendous anxiety for me, yeah. because I came up my writing. You know, my formative years for my writing were not. It wasn't in English class. I, I'm not. You know, I don't have a degree in English. It's not from being in a scene of writers. I've never had that. I, I'm not like. You know, it's not like on TV where I would go to like parties where there's all these other writers in New York and we're all hanging out and doing it like they are on TV. I was a guy, I was just a regular normal person working a series of office jobs, you know, through a temp agency, um, writing in my spare time in the internet. Well, back then during those formative years, everyone was anonymous. Everybody's using some mm -hmm. sort of fake like hacker username. Um, and then I was writing as David Wong, this the fake the name of this character in the story that I had written on an, in a notebook in high school. Um, that I had written a series of stories like a, that it was just this character I created, um, and the whole point was to completely separate myself from the stuff I was writing, not just for the practical reason that I didn't want like my coworkers at the office to find it and say, "Well, is this article making fun of me?" Because that's what everybody does when they find out you're writing, or or people when they find out you're writing a book, or if they read a book, they'll they'll think they'll point to one of the characters and they're like, was that supposed to be me? It's like uh, that's not how it, it works. You, okay. you don't grab people from life, or at least I, I I don't I don't know how that would even work. You don't grab people from real life and just put them in your book without their permission. Yeah, because that would be so weird. And you're like describing their body or like a sex scene or something. Yeah. And it's like one of your coworkers. That's that would be. I'm not sure that's legal to do that. So inappropriate and creepy. But I. So that means I came up in an era when your personality was totally separate from the work. The work lived on its own. It was its own thing. That lived on, on online behind a username, and people didn't know anything about me, other than I assumed they knew that like everyone 
who was writing that the username was was fake. Like all the details were fake, all the biographical de- details that this is a drunk. The, the story was always that it's this drunken white guy who has picked this pseudonym David Wong so that people couldn't find him because there would be like too many people with that name in the world. Um, and that that would, they would never trace this back to me in where I live, you know, anything about my personality, my family, none of that, because it's just the work lives on its own. I never, ever, ever wanted it to be the thing where someone would read it or buy the book based on celebrity, based on, oh, mm-hmm. this is from famous person blank. Mm-hmm. Because I like this famous person, I will buy this book. I, it's like, no, I want you I, I want you to be a fan of the book. I want you to be obsessed with the book, whatever. I don't want you to be a fan of me as a human being or to be obsessed with me or to want to meet me or anything. I never wanted that. Mm-hmm. So that's why the early internet suited me so well, because there's such a creative freedom when you're not sitting here thinking, well, what will my grandma think about <laughs> what I just typed? Or, or how will my, you know, my family or my coworkers view, you know, because I've got all the cynical stuff about office life or about work, you know, how will my, what will my floor supervisor think when, when she reads this? You, when you complete your, completely separate yourself from it, you have the freedom to be as weird as you want. And that's the whole point of creativity for me is that all the stuff you can't say in polite company, you can get it out of your system and put it out there and create something that's pure and weird or whatever. And then all of the other weird people in the world see it and read it and connect with it. As time has gone on, as the technology of the internet has improved, they gained the ability to post photographs that loaded quickly. And then very recently, only about, gosh, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago, we gained the ability to do video very easily. And then in the mobile era, which only goes back to 2000 and gosh, 2012, 2013, when you start to have things like unlimited um, data plans where people can now watch video or long form video on the subway, on the bus, in the waiting room of the doctor's office, you've gone from text to a more professional internet where it's writing, but it's writing with a real name, real byline, usually a photo on the byline. This is when you start seeing newspapers migrate to the internet. So it's got to be a little bit more professional. And then from there to a photo-based internet where you see Facebook, Instagram, the social media, you know, where it's really heavily, heavily about here's photos of my dinner, of my family, of my, you know, my pets, you know, me, my, my children, all that to where, and then finally, evolving to what I guess will be known as the TikTok era, but the YouTube era, the Twitch era, and then TikTok where it's video, video, video. Mm -hmm. It's all video. Like the new young people, they only want to interact with video. That's rough for somebody who (laughs) who came about where the entire thing is that the work is separate from from me and my face and my voice and my, like you're watching this and you're trying to judge whether or not to buy this book we're talking about and it's like, well, do I want to buy a book from a guy who has that chair, like that brand of office Those chair? Headphones. Like what kind of a guy, yeah, who buys such lame headphones? Like that, does he not care about music? Why doesn't he have like fancy noise canceling cans? Like why, you know, is somebody like, like what's what's the personality of somebody who used ten dollar headphones or who it, it, whatever I'm seeing in the background here has got these weird blinds? Those are the blinds of a a bad writer. <laughs> Bad writer blinds. It's a problem. My initial thought right when you popped in. <laughs> and and yet, because and I, you think I'm joking, but that it is a an algorithm and an engagement platform that is so heavily based on do people like looking at your face? Oh, do they yeah. like the sound of your voice? <laughs> and there's a joke that is, I think I saw it on a T-shirt or on a bumper sticker, is that music was better back when they used to allow ugly people to sing. Yeah. And to where you imagine like in the modern, like in the MTV era, if Queen had come up around then, if you wouldn't have had some executive say like Freddie Mercury, like, well, but that overbite is yeah. weird. Like your face is weird. Like, eh, eh, you know, um, or that if, you know, any singer who was overweight or anything like now singers all look like supermodels. And it's like you logically, 
that's not to insult any of them. Like they, they, they're great singers, but it's like, logically it's clear you're filtering certain people out of the pipeline. Right. So if I turn on my TikTok and I'm following every author I can find on there and I can see that the algorithm is like favoring like the young and pretty people, it, it again, that's not, that's not their fault. Like, oh, no, no, like no, yeah. they may be writing great books, but it's, it's kind of like, I can feel you filtering the weird looking people out of your pipeline. There should be more weird looking <laughs> authors because some of our great authors of the past, we're weird looking people. That's, yeah. you know, that's, that's what's, that's why they escaped into uh, writing. But I'm imagining like, say, I don't feel like HP Lovecraft would have excelled in the TikTok era. <laughs> Probably not. No. Yeah. Now, some of you listening to this are thinking, that he would have had the most spectacular TikTok account. Like you are so wrong about that. He might have, yeah. <laughs> it's it's impossible to say. But the point is that a lot of the great books you've read were from people that had very poor hygiene or whatever because or social they, skills. Yeah, yeah and, and they had personalities that I mean, you can read about their personal life, and it's like, well, he got divorced three times, and then he shot himself at age forty three, <laughs> and it's not that. It's not that their poor social skills made them good writers, but when you read it, part of what you found fascinating was how that they have unusual thought patterns and un unusual observations about the world. And because of that, they don't relate easily to people. And because they don't relate easily to people, they tend to not have a lot of friends. And because they don't tend to have a lot of friends, they've not shaped their personality to be mm. outgoing and gregarious and articulate. You know, they have a speech impediment or they're just very quiet. Mm. Or they don't make eye contact because they just didn't, they don't spend their time socializing. They spent their time right. sitting around daydreaming about monsters and things like that. So I started a TikTok a month ago because reluctantly, after years of being told, Jason, you need social media, <laughs> the whole, the whole audience has moved to TikTok. Oh, I've, I would not still be here with the book deal if I hadn't mastered certain social media accounts. I have a, a Twitter with about 50,000 followers. That's where I spend most of my time. It is the most toxic place on earth. Don't go on there. If you don't have a Twitter account, don't, don't I go like, on. I like your Twitter. I like um, your Twitter too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I have a Twitter. I have three Facebook pages that uh, want the, my oldest Facebook page. I think I started Jesus 15 years ago, more, Jeez. probably closer to 20. Um, because I have a I have a Facebook page for each of the the book series, and I have one that's just for me personally, not my personal account, but like a fan page for just all of my writing in general. Um, and I've got an Instagram, I've got a Twitter, I have a Substack newsletter slash blog, I have a YouTube page, I have a TikTok. Oh, yeah. You've come around. Uh, so I had all those things, and as as each new thing came along, I joined up because I have been in this business long enough. Uh, a lot of people know who know me know that my day job was, I, you know, the editor at Cracked, as you mentioned in the intro, for thirteen years from two thousand seven to two thousand twenty. I know as traffic migrates from platform to platform to platform, you have to follow it. Now, more famous authors do not have to do this. Stephen King does not have to join TikTok. No. George R. R. Martin does not need to join TikTok. I, th I'm not either of those guys. I, I do, I do very well. I am among the most fortunate authors in that I am able to write books full time. That is a tiny, tiny percentage of authors out there. Right. But in order to sell enough books to to do it full time, because of the media environment we're in. People immediately forget about you after your book has come out for a right. few weeks yeah. later. It's just that there's too much other stuff. There's too much other stuff to watch. There are shows that I watched and loved five, six, seven years ago and just would will get blindsided by the fact that they've made multiple additional seasons after that. Yeah, Same. Totally forget. Because I dropped the streaming service it was on. Because like, well, I'm not really watching anything on Showtime. I'll drop it from my cable channel. And then you realize, oh, wait a second. Showtime was where they had that one sh show. I really like that. And they're on season five now. Where, Well, the creators of that show would probably be baffled. It's like, well, what did we do wrong? Like, why, what was it? The, the, this plot line you didn't like? It's like, well, no, I just dropped Showtime from my package because I forgot that's the channel you were on. Yeah, well, that's the 500 media. new hours of YouTube is uploaded every minute. Uh, yeah, well, exactly. Or or Twitch or TikTok or any of the these things that you could be do doing other than watching that show. So 
And that's and that's talking about a, a watching a show, which is a passive thing you can just watch. To get people to actually read a book, which is an active thing, um, you're climbing a mountain for each individual copy you sell. Yeah. Uh, so if if this interview re results in me selling like 13 copies of the book, that's great. That's a good that's a good use of of a couple of hours of my time. Totally. Um, so anyway, because I had that experience working at Cranked, I just know the audiences migrate from platform to platform. And if you don't go with them, you will get left behind. That's just the nature of it. The, the kids are not on Facebook anymore. No. The kids are not on Twitter anymore. They're not on Instagram anymore. They're on uh, uh, Twitch it, and TikTok, Snapchat and uh, in Twitch and TikTok. And so I only a month ago, belatedly, like I should have had a TikTok years ago. Um, I moved on there and have done really well. I instantly had a video go viral, but I maybe, I guess maybe because I've got some friends on there that are popular and they helped boosting it or whatever i got very lucky i have like eight thousand followers i think nice um and something like five million views across the collective videos i've posted there but this isn't ever what i what i wanted because for, for example i've tried to upload a couple of things where it's me like filming something in my house or something like like my dog whatever those videos don't do very well on tiktok they want your face Oh, yeah. they they want like the oh, yeah. videos the thumbnails people click on or, or whatever that they react to it's got to be a face talking to them and i never wanted that to be um you know i'm oh i'm gonna buy this book because this is that guy it's got that face i like looking at it's like <laughs> i i will never win that game because i'm just it's like i'm back in high school again where it's a popularity <laughs> yeah. contest oh yeah and nobody liked the weird guy who just stays at home, you know, reading uh, horror novels or whatever all, all the time. It's got to be the people that know how to dress and know how to talk and that they're funny and they're, yeah, they know how to tell funny stories and anecdotes and they're charming. It's like, I don't, I don't have any of that. And so the internet, when it came along, rescued me from that. Cause like, here's a place where the stuff I write is popular. Oh my gosh. The thought, the thought that a thousand people, I remember the first time a thousand people read something I wrote. It's like a thousand people read this thing I wrote it, and I lived my whole life, you know, I, a, a total of, of convinced like three people to be my friend in the entire time I've been alive. <laughs> and here's a thousand people reading this thing saying, this is really interesting. I wish I could meet you and talk to you someday. It's like, no, no, no you, you don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I wrote that's let that be the whole of, of me, the work. And if I could stay anonymous and just produce the work, I would absolutely do it. It is mentally taxing for me to be out there. That is not the world we live in. And if we have aspiring authors out there listening to this, and I know we do, if you find a way to write your books and to, to effectively sell them and get the word out and get the publicity out without having to do all this, without having to get a TikTok and, and, and comb your hair and, and get on there every day, my email is <laughs> jasonpargin at protonmail.com. Write down how you did it and tell me, and then I'll do it. If you want to charge me for the advice, I will I will pay you. Because as far as I can tell, because I know hundreds of authors, that's, my, that's everybody I know on the internet. It's other writers. It's other people who, if they're not writing books, they're, they're bloggers or people trying to make it in, in journalism or in some kind of writing or they're YouTubers, whatever. It's, it's all just different forms of, of doing, trying to do the long form content. All of them would love some other way to. Uh, totally why they started writing in the first place. Yeah. Like you said, because it's, it's your way to relate to the world when, when talking face to face, you find it difficult. It's like the things that I'm feeling, the things I observe, it's hard for me to put into words when I'm looking at you because I get nervous or I stammer or whatever, um, or just I'm off-putting in my manner. You know, I, I come I look like I'm mad or weird or, or I don't, you know, I don't listen well, but then you sit down, it's just you and the keyboard and you can put all those thoughts and dress them up and, and really convey them and bring somebody else into your worldview. It's a beautiful thing, but as the technology has evolved very quickly, um, it's like, no, you, in order to get people to read this beautiful thing you wrote, you need to be able to sell it as a human being staring into a camera. 
right. where half the comments are going to be about, you know, hey, you're putting on a few pounds, or I don't like <laughs> I don't like the goatee. What 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 was what was the idea behind growing the goatee? You think it would make you look more like a writer? What's going on? Why why are you Oof. touching your face so much? Uh, why um, you're drinking? What are you drinking? Smart water? What would you pay like four dollars for? You know, it's just tap water, right? <laughs> You know, that that's like a prank that they called it smart water because it proves you're you're dumb by paying that much for it. <laughs> like everything about how you live. I mean, you've you've been on the internet before, I assume. Oh uh, yeah. Dabble. If there's a <laughs> if somebody posts a YouTube video or an Instagram clip of them, it's like a funny video of them feeding their dog like a a wacky food. Like a, it's like, oh, it's my dog's birthday. I'm feeding it a cupcake and it's got icing on its snout. And then the comments are like, I can't believe you're feeding that dog icing. It's got sugar red in it. This can be toxic to dogs. Or whatever. Right. And it's like this person is trying to share this simple thing. And there's the nature of the internet where because humans are kind of, we're always sizing ourselves up to other people in the moment mm -hmm. you put yourself out there as like, Oh, I'm famous. I created a thing. They want to be able to kind of like, like knock you down, you know, yeah. like the, uh, well, you know, you're, you're doing this wrong or you're. And so it is a weird place to be where you feel like it's, it's like the mean girls from high school <laughs> <laughs> only forever. Uh, <laughs> where it's like you're nitpicking, you know, or, or you're dressed stylishly enough. And and to address the elephant in the room, because I know I've not mentioned it yet, I get this would be a hundred times worse if I were a woman. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I would even, yeah, it's daily. Because <laughs> again, I can yeah. see the comments on their posts. I can see it. Like I follow oh, yeah. authors, book reviewers, my book, my book, my Instagram is just, my follows are all bookstagrammers. Um, but if it's a young woman and like, it's to try to find a comment, like how far in the comments can I go before I see someone commenting on her appearance? Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like here, people that comment in this may joke about something about like, Oh, he, he paid that much for that chair. Like those chairs are like, that's a ripoff, but it's not the relentless scrutiny of, you know, that a woman gets about, you know, is she dressed to provocatively oh, yeah. or she's showing off her cleavage awful. or she's trying to yeah um so i get it i i know and, and i cannot imagine i by the time the internet was invented i was already an adult right and by the time i was working professionally in the internet i was in my 30s so i was fully formed to the idea of growing up with this like on camera growing up on tiktok and you're you're nine years old and you're on tiktok and you gotta oh man you have to be a child and have to think in terms of, are they going to make fun of my hair if I wear it this way? Or what's, does my outfit look right? I didn't have that growing up. I, my entire closet was like Chicago bears t-shirts. Like that was it. I had like five t-shirts that I just alternated. Uh, and the idea that, you know, at that young age, you've got to consider like, what does my bedroom look like in the background? Is this, you know, cause you can see it, you can see how they've carefully arranged the stuff behind oh, yeah. them. Absolutely. It's like, man, that you had to expend the thought to do that i can't imagine yeah um tiktok is definitely a pretty strange place i mean um like everything that you said i 100 percent can yes. resonate with absolutely i mean i think um one of the cool things about it that i've found is that mm. you know you there are those people out there that are going to try to tear you down a little bit there are it's just it's just you know comes with the territory um What's kind of cool about it is the, the the sheer volume of people on there and your ability to block people. So like the, the combination of those two things can make for a pretty cool audience for someone like yourself who's got like this niche uh, like thing that you're trying to do, right? You're writing cosmic horror, you're, you know, um, and I think that you, you'll find as, you, as your page keeps growing, because uh, you've only been on there for like a month, but um, I think you're going you're gonna to amass quite a few more followers and they're, you're going to notice a trend, a, a community start forming in that particular sphere of you know, like-minded people. An echo chamber, if you will. I don't, yeah. uh, echo, echo chamber has a, a, has a bit of a negative connotation, but it's kind of nice sometimes to, you know, the, just for the sheer amount of people that are interacting with that app and interacting with your content, you are going to start, you know, it's going to, you're going to, you're going to find like-minded people that are also, they have your like, back. Yeah. They have your back a little bit. And, um, you know, you, you're, you're writing excellent books and 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think you're, I don't think you're off putting. <laughs> no, I, I don't think cool. so either. <laughs> but <laughs> I, but that's the thing is, I don't. It is that's very kind to say, <laughs> but the whole <laughs> issue is that if I get good at this, like, and I, I hey, I, I when I sat down and looked at TikTok, I have probably twenty hours of scrolling through and observing what people post. Yeah, because again, to be clear. I've been doing this professional for, professionally for a long, long time. I started my first website in 1997. That's 25 years ago. Okay. You know, I worked at Cranked as the executive editor there. And again, this is Cranked. This is a content website where the, the content, how it does is based entirely on algorithms, how it performs on Facebook, how it performs on Google, how it performs on Twitter, right? Yeah. Uh, so I've when I sit down and start something like TikTok, like I'm sitting down and saying, okay, what do they want what is the ideal right. length of a video what type mm -hmm. of thing how do they use the hashtags and i i'm good at it because i have thousands of hours of practice i have thousands of hours of practice by necessity because i would love to have worked for crank as you know if it was just in the olden days like just a magazine or, or something where you're only thinking in terms of getting talented writers on board and using your right. judgment of what's interesting and that's not that's not how it is it, you have to think in terms of what what makes stuff trend what's the average length of content that does well because if you don't the lights go off like right. everybody yeah. gets fired which eventually happened um <laughs> it, it, so I take pride in trying to be good at this. And like I've I've guessed I, I'm a guest on I would say about 40, 40 hours of podcast a year. I try to do about one a week. I, I joke that I'm a professional podcast guest who writes <laughs> books in my spare time. Wow. Um and my life is about 80% promotion, 20% writing books. Wow. Is is the ratio. Again, I'm not prescribing that young authors out there, if you just got physically ill at the sound of me giving you that ratio. <laughs> so I'm not saying that's how you'll have to do it. We just told a story of somebody who sold a, a book to a huge movie studio and they don't even exist. Yeah. So <laughs> apparently it can be done even if you don't have a corporeal body at all. You can it can be done. I'm saying that in, in my circumstance, somebody who came from the internet, my day job was on the internet. 80% of my time and energy is in promotion, scheduling promotion, writing tweets, you know, doing TikToks or coming up something to post on Instagram, all that stuff. And that those I, I, I mentioned, I listed like nine different social media outlets or, or newsletters I have to maintain. That's gets me just enough book sales to keep doing it full time. If it wow. dropped by like 20%, I would have to go, go back and try to find a full time job somewhere. Um, it, that's, that's, that amount of promotion is just enough to keep me, keep my, my nose above, above the water in the proverbial uh, drowning room, I guess I'm in, uh, that's so yeah. much work. Yeah. It's also a little unfortunate because there's an opportunity lost there. You know I mean? It's, there's so many good things that come about from it. Yes. But you know, if you could spend 40% of that 80% of time on writing, you know, how much better of an author would you be? In fact, like. How many more I'd books not, would you write? Yeah, but yeah exactly. I, Please don't take this as a statement of your first book was bad, but I could see very clearly your progress as an author from book one to this one. I mean, it's... And where would you be if you could spend... Twice the all, time. All, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And because I... Just to be... I, I don't know if, it, if it's clear that when I talk about how much time you spend on Twitter, if you say, well, Twitter, that's like, you're posting like two sentences. How long does it take you to, are you really sitting there for four hours composing your 280 character tweet? That's not the thing. Mm -hmm. If you want to do well on Twitter, you have to learn Twitter. Understand. You have to be yeah. on Twitter as a consumer. Interact with people. Right. It's community. If yeah. you want to be good at TikTok, you need to be observing other people's TikToks. You need to be watching right. and using it as a platform. That's the only way you're going to learn how to do it. Because again, the goal is not just to post TikToks. The goal is to post TikToks that people are actually going to want to look at. And there's many, many subtleties in terms of um, what will people, what are people on here to, to do? What are they on here to get? And especially on Twitter, when it is their algorithm heavily, heavily favors are you joining a conversation that everybody is having? Here's the thing everybody is talking about today. Here's the news event, or whatever. And there's all the hashtags and all that. Because again, on these social media platforms, just because someone has 
chosen to follow your page or follow your account, the way these platforms are set up, they will not see your posts unless the algorithm chooses to show it to them because the default on Twitter isn't see everything everybody posts. It's the home screen where Twitter decides which yeah. of the people you follow and which total strangers they're going to feed you. Same thing with TikTok. You have two tabs. You have for you, which is TikTok's mysterious algorithm deciding what you see. And then another tab of just you can only see the people you're following. Nobody goes to that one. The software defaults to this one, the for you page. And that's the one where they decide. And if there are people on TikTok right now, I can go on their actual accounts and see them posting exhausted by the fact that their traffic has just plummeted by 90 percent oh yeah by why their views because their algorithm flipped a switch mm -hmm. and all of their audience went away and and it would be easy to say well now hold on these people chose to follow me why aren't they seeing my posts it's like well because they're not being fed they're not being stitched into the for you page anymore same thing on youtube it doesn't matter if they subscribe to you most people don't go to your channel they go to the home tab and on home, YouTube will feed them some stuff from who they're following and some other crap they threw in. But all of these social media platforms, they want to dictate what you see. And that means as a producer or someone who is trying to become visible on there as an author, just anyone trying to get eyeballs on their work, you have to spend a lot of hours on there observing how the information moves, how the posts move, how the audiences move, what the algorithm, what the algorithms favor. And only by watching it and seeing what you post and what gets traction and what did well, what didn't, can you eventually get good at it? And by getting good at it, you gain an audience. And if you say, I can't imagine, Jason, something more depressing <laughs> than knowing that I got good at Twitter. Like that should be, that should disqualify you from from society that you're good at Twitter. But right now in 2022, if you want to be an author, knowing that the publisher is not going to spend huge money to publicize the book for you, that's not how this works. Yeah, they don't need to. I'm, you know, it, I'm able to do this full time because I got a serious advance on my books. It means that the publisher will spend more than for most authors because they've got an investment in it. They don't want to lose the money they've already paid me because I assure you, that money's already gone. They're not getting it back. <laughs> right. But if you're a smaller author and they've only given you a, an advance of a few thousand dollars or whatever, which is what the vast majority of the of the authors, that's the situation they're in, they're not going to throw more money after that. From their point of view, you're going to sell a few hundred copies and then whatever else we sell is just gravy. But it is on you, the author, to make that happen. So if you, you know, if anybody out there, if you're writing a novel and you're, you're wanting to pitch it to an agent or an editor or somebody, the first question they're going to ask is what's your, they'll usually phrase it as what's your marketing plan for this book. But what they're really asking is, do you have a bunch of followers on How many followers? YouTube or somewhere? And if you don't, it, that's rough. I'm not saying you can't get a book deal without it. I, I, I it, it's just. If you were able to get a book deal without that, again, please let me know how you did it. And I think in a lot of cases, the answer is just, well, you they knew somebody. They they work at they they wrote, you know, a bunch of great essays for the the New Yorker or something, and they made a lot of friends who were editors and agents and stuff. And so their their debut book got they had a lot of powerful people in positions of doing reviews and things like that. that the publisher, you know, they got them behind it. They weren't doing a guerrilla marketing thing, um, right? You know, where they're having to go out and pound the pavement and, and do do every podcast they can find and, and try to get some traction to to their their Twitter or their their TikTok or whatever. Yeah, hey, I always thought it might be. A, I mean, this would never work because it's um, it wouldn't make any money. <laughs> but I always thought it'd be an interesting experiment to have a social media platform like TikTok or Instagram where you could only follow a hundred people. That's it. There's a cap mm -hmm. on the amount of people that you can follow, and so you are seeing literally everything that 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 you're that the people that you're following post because that's as much uh, you know of the screen that it's able to take up or whatever. Um, so that would mean that if you've got a hundred thousand followers on this platform, it means every one of those followers that you have chose you 
and kept you in like their right. pool of a hundred that they that they can't follow any more than that. So Take then you've away got from others. It's like the most engaging audience you could possibly have because they've chosen you out of a bunch. Because that's one of the things. It's like you know some of the people that follow you are also following ten thousand people. You know, so their algorithm is completely messed up on their end because there's just so much for them to be able to see. But if they were only following a finite amount of people, they would always see your stuff. But that would be a very creator-centered platform, which is not in yeah. the interest of <laughs> who could make the, the most that, content would right, win that yeah. battle. You know, I always thought that'd be like a, a fun experiment. It would fail immediately, obviously. But well, and not only that, I bet it exists. We just we've just never heard about it. Right? Yeah, I'm sure somebody's <laughs> like every, had the idea. Yeah. Every utopian idea of of a it's like well there should be there should be one where there's no algorithms it, it only yeah, feeds you the stuff yeah. you ask to see and and there should be a version of it where um, there's no there's no bonds or spam so like you have to pay some small amount but a, a trivial mm -hmm. amount to join but it's just to keep the bots off of it you know yeah. every idea we have for what seems like well why don't they do this that would be perfect. And then you find out, oh, somebody tried to do that in two thousand four, and, and, uh, and everybody they lost all their money, and they all yeah. they all were never allowed in the industry again because no one because the things we we say we want or that we think we want versus the actual preferences we reveal <laughs> in our actual <laughs> lives are very are very different, very different. Uh, mm -hmm. because I you know I know this from the days of of posting stuff it it, it cracked is that. There's certain type of of articles that the fans say they want and insist they want, but it's like I've seen the traffic right. and the amount of um or for example, people who say, well, you know, if there was a version of the site that didn't have ads on it, but you just you you know it only cost like a trivial amount of money to to browse it. I'd rather do that. I hit all the ads. It's like see, I'll see we tried that. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> I've seen I've seen the books. I know how few of you signed up for that. Um, you know, because a lot of these things, it, it, what seems obvious, it seems so insidious what they're doing with all of these, these sites and the way it encourages bad behavior encourages the worst type of like clickbait and that kind of thing. But the issue is that ultimately the algorithms are catering to human impulses that, that like, like it sucks that the, at the time we're recording this, there there's just there's just been like a dumb controversy over they cast a black actress as the Little Mermaid, and this has been dominating Twitter and I guess probably TikTok too for the last couple of days. Um, we're about to change that, <laughs> and and it's like you want to say, oh, it sucks that these platforms boost that stuff, but people like yelling about that stuff. They 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 it's. They have their own data that says, hey, we can see how long you you stay engaged with content. We can see what you click on. We can see what you choose to engage with and what you choose to react to. And it's this stupid crap. <laughs> like or the you author complain, of the own things we complain about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you could have you could have read more news about the upcoming like rail worker strike or any of the actual important things in the world. Yeah. You didn't. You chose to follow this dumb drama about the Little Mermaid for four straight hours. We have it right here in our database. Uh, so you're a liar if you claim if you claim otherwise. I have a question here, and it's um, I mean, I think this is a pretty interesting question, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can already if, tell it's gonna suck uh, i'm just kidding <laughs> you've, built, you've built it up too much now oh, you can't live um, up to your story of my life uh if you could sit down and have dinner or end drinks uh with oh yeah, excuse me you don't drink if you could sit down and have dinner with one author living or dead who would it be somehow i have never been asked that question before really but i the funny thing is is that I don't want to be any of these people. Like I, <laughs> like I love, like Douglas Adams' work meant so much to me that I wouldn't be the same person if I hadn't stumbled across those books. I can detect from those books enough about Douglas Adams' personality <laughs> that we would not have enjoyed each other's company. It, it, it's so in, when you ask me, well, which ones would you want to meet? It's a completely different question than which ones did you find their books really interesting? And I know that that's almost shameful because you, you could say, well, yeah, well, don't you want to ask them questions about their creative process or ask them and 
Actually, no, I don't. Because yeah. I want, even though I'm a, I do this for a living, I want it to be mysterious. How Magical. they, I yeah. want it to be. I want to believe the the story from. Um, how can this is? I can't believe that you don't want to see the Oz behind the curtain. The 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 novel on the road, Jack Kerouac. The popular conception of how he wrote that book was that he had one long stream of like butcher paper and then he sat down and just typed it in a in a long in a fever of creativity. Mm-hmm. And this was the way I, I had heard about it when I was like in college. Like, well, yeah, yeah, like they've still got this original. Like he just it's just this one long stretch of paper. And then found out much, much later, he wrote that over the course of 10 years and it had been relentlessly edited and changed and revised. And like the uh the sequel to um to kill a mockingbird that came out a few years ago right from the estate of which is my nightmare where they they like dug right. up this draft yeah, that's yeah, we and could published it lots of detail about that yeah that's oh, and that that it turned out this was like an earlier draft of to kill a mockingbird and that the decision to not have the dad be racist was like a was like made in editing it's like, have you tried making them not be racist? It's like, yeah, let's try it that way. It's like, no, no, no I don't want to know that. I don't. The, the fact that the book 1984 was almost called 1982, <laughs> and that he just randomly decided 1984 sounded better. It's like, no, that ruins, that ruins Thanks. the magic. Uh, you know, or the, like, yeah, well, the publisher and I, we went through a bunch of different titles, and and you know, we were going to call it uh, the Winston versus uh, the the future dickheads and then we decided just giving it doing a year and then we just we we batted around various years it's like no it's it's pure like it's it's that year it's so ominous and just the title of the year no it's perfect because it's um so in terms of which authors i would actually like to speak to um boy that is a great question because i i can't i can't give this answer Hey, that's an answer too. I like it. No, no. <laughs> uh, uh, there's an unnamed author who wrote a book that was a huge hit with children and adults alike, and it spawned a movie series and sold millions and millions of copies. Um, and the author has just become controversial for other reasons that we don't need to get into today. This hypothetical author, I would love to talk to them about. What was it like the moment you realized your creation had gotten away from you? Hmm. Not because early on, it's like big book deal, making some money, movie deal. That's cool. The moment when you realized you had made a global phenomenon. Yeah. Because I think that um, uh, Tolkien, I momentarily forgot the rest of his name. J.R.R. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> I almost called him George R.R. Tolkien because I mixed him up with. I mean, George did guy. take the R.R. Like, that's bold of him. In fact, you know what? Let's pretend that the author I was talking about a moment ago was George R.R. Martin. Sure. Because okay. it was um, the famous children's story he wrote, Game right. of Thrones. Yeah. What was it like? <laughs> be- because he's someone who wrote for a long time, worked in TV, decently successful. Got a decent deal, a pretty bu- big book deal to write this fantasy epic based on whatever you know he'd been, but he had put in his time. He it wasn't like he was you know nineteen was years seasoned. old and yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. had been around. And so, but it, he wasn't a household name; like nobody knew the name George R. R. Martin. It's you know he he he's got an IMDb page, you know, yeah. he, and he he had um, he you know objectively a successful writer, and he had made a living right living writing for decades. If you can do that. That is, you are an amazing success. I don't care how much money you've made. If nobody knows your name, if you don't, you know, if, if you're not celebrated, it doesn't matter. If you're able to make a living writing your whole life, you're a success. So he was already a success, decides he's going to write this fantasy story, writes it, pretty decent hit. Second book, but, but it didn't earn its advance back. Game right. of Thrones, it didn't, it didn't earn out the advance. So probably disappointing, probably felt some disappointment. You know, probably some decent fans, probably when he went to conventions, probably people would yeah. line up to sign it. Second book, I think, is when it really took off as a series. 
And then people from Hollywood start talking about, okay, let's talk about doing an adaptation. Right. And then the TV show comes along and it is now 25 million copies. Everybody knows your face, your name, like that distinct look of the beard and the hat and suspenders. Yeah, the dream you, you like that's a look like that is a you're a like a you're like an icon you're Your like brand. Colonel Sanders at, at Kentucky Fried Chicken you're, you're like a a caricature and everybody knows your face it is clear from the tinge of bitterness you hear when I'm talking about it <laughs> that it is he like any writer no doubt was thrilled with the success thrilled that all of these people all around the globe love this thing that he's made. Mm-hmm. But there still clearly was a moment where it got away from him. Right. It wasn't where his anymore. He is not at the reins anymore. Yeah. It is much, much, much bigger than him. It is a merchandising empire. The guys who made Rick and Morty surely feel like this. Right. It mm-hmm. is a merchandising empire. It is a meme. People are dressing like these characters for Halloween. Yeah. Like something that originally was an extremely weird niche cartoon that aired on the middle of the night at Cartoon Network, suddenly McDonald's is doing promotions. Suddenly they're promoting it at the Super Bowl. Like there has to be this moment when you realize this is doesn't belong to me anymore. How were you able to sit down and write the next book? And I think George R. R. Martin's response would be, I simply never wrote it. Didn't do it. <laughs> right. You know? Or but, put it out piecemeal, you know, which is what he's been doing. But he clearly has struggled with it. Very much, and yeah. it, it's, it is a creative struggle. And I would assume, I don't pretend to know his name. We're not friends. I've never met him. But I would assume it is unbelievably difficult to create in that environment and to mm-hmm. shut yourself off from yeah. it. It's not the same as when you're writing a movie and it's like, oh, the pressure of writing a Star Wars movie. It's like, well, you're not doing that alone, though. A Star Wars movie these days is not written by one guy. It is a meeting of the director and whoever else involved, the producers, all the people at Disney, all the executives. Like It is a team effort, and then what you come up with is just this very bland, like you wouldn't claim it's yours. It's just this... There's input from everybody else. It's like, well, we need also, you know, we need a cameo from uh, the, the, the whatever Thor. Right. Yeah, the <laughs> Thanos has got to turn up in your Star Wars movie because we own them both now. What, whatever. Out of time. Like, um, so that's different with a book that is ultimately just you. It's not a team effort. There's nobody else you can lean on. It is you at the computer. So shutting out the noise. I don't know how you do it because even the amount of noise that I have in my life, when I am one hundredth of 1% as successful as some of these people, if you've built, like I'm imagining if, you know, like let's say that another movie got made from, because I don't know if we barely mentioned that the first, I, I became successful because the first book. I wanted to ask print, you about it, that experience. Yeah. yeah really immediately became yeah. a film, but it became a niche film. It was a, a direct, it is a cult favorite yeah. Beloved by awesome people movie. who love weird horror, but it was not the Avengers. Well, <laughs> no. if you think of some alternate universe where my thing had become Rick and Morty, which, by the way, very similar premise. Not saying yeah. they stole it from me, but it's people <laughs> who are who are ill suited to deal with interdimensional threats, suddenly finding themselves faced with things, and then that you have multiple people with very different worldviews. In their case, you have the all-knowing scientist and a teenage boy. Couldn't be more different. Their approaches to life couldn't be more different. And then that's the joke is it's, you know, and in both cases, they're like very gruesome, bloody, profane, but then built around hopefully kind of a smart idea. Well, imagine an alternate universe where this thing I made became Rick and Morty, where there's people dressing up as John and David Amy at at Halloween. Well, that's the thing. You don't know. It's it's a crapshoot. It, like it doesn't have anything to do with how good your thing is. It, right. it, like it's uh, you know Harry Potter. There's a million stories like Harry Potter. There are a million right. young adult fantasy books that could have been Harry Potter instead of Harry Potter. There's nothing right. unique about a, a an eleven year old child finds out they have magical powers. No, and goes off to a magical land and has adventures and finds out there's a a threat they have to help take down. Like that story has been told. 
a bunch. It's the story. It's the story. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, and like it was on the shelf next to other books that were identical, identical to it. If you just, just, just tweaking the, you know, the details, um, she wasn't first, she wasn't best, but things came together right. in whatever way that blew it up. And that could happen to anybody. I, I mean, there's people out there that will tell you the Game of Thrones. Like there's everything that I think of, because I'm not a really a fantasy reader. Everything I think of that's unique about Game of Thrones, that there's tons of nudity and gore. It's like, well, no, that's a whole genre of fantasy. Like it's adult fantasy. There's a whole, there's shelves full of it. And Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire is not the best. There's, well, there's I mean, other, Martin, but, uh, so Mar- Martin took the idea from, I mean, he he based that whole book on the War of the Roses between the, the Lancasters and the Starks. And uh, he even said that he took a lot of influence on the intrigue from a series by a French author named Maurice Drouin, uh, who wrote like essentially the, the same kind of <laughs> plot that the uh, Game of Thrones is. I mean, he he's admitted uh, the amount of influence that he's taken from and how uh, it's not anything particularly new in the fantasy genre. It's yeah, and, and I think any honest author would say the same thing right yeah that, you, can't you know it in a it's, vacuum. yeah please yeah. please don't think that i'm the first person to ever have the idea of of this so there's a a cramp shoot element to it of what the world decides we're all going to be obsessed with this now for a mm-hmm. while and then the fact that it can instantly go away because like it can fall out of favor just just as fast right, look at you it, know, season eight eight Game season yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but but see but that's a great example because he by that by the time the season that everybody hated came around he was no longer involved in the show right uh, because again they they had they had moved past the books they had to start writing you know plot of their own and they weren't consulting with him anymore because he was kind of bitter that they hadn't stopped and waited for him to finish the book which was never going to happen they it doesn't work that way these actors are under contract they're they're aging like no the the show has to go on and it, i would have to think the moment the show progressed beyond the plots he'd written in the books and became something that was wholly written by somebody else. And these are your characters you invented your universe, your themes, your motivations, all that stuff. And you see that these people had a totally different opinion. Like, like Tyrion in the show became a a good, a hero, a good guy. And in the books, it's clear he's on a path to become just a deranged psychopath. Like he's on the path to become like a serial killer or something. Then in the book, but in the, in the show, because Peter Dinklage, a great actor, incredibly charming and handsome and cool. And fans don't want, uh, you know, serial killer Tyrion. They want cool hero, you know, um, and so the TV show, they went where what with what the audience wanted. And at that point, now it doesn't belong to you anymore. It doesn't just belong to the audience. It belongs to HBO. It belongs to this giant corporation. It belongs to this writer's room for this TV show. Some of these people you probably now at this point have never met. Um, they're not asking your opinion because they can't. Uh, like They've got to do it on their own schedule based on what they've got planned, what actors they have access to for or, or whatever. Um that would be to and the question you asked me like 45 minutes ago if i had to have <laughs> dinner with him i'd have dinner with somebody like that because i would yeah. ask how did you deal with that 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 the thing you made went off into the universe and then grew and became like a monster like this like you're seeing it everywhere like you can't get away from it you're driving down the street and there's like billboards with your character on it selling that fast food or, or whatever it's like that's so i w- when the game of thrones season eight came out oreo cookies released game of thrones edition <laughs> oreos <laughs> with like a picture of the throne yeah that's that's so much that's just so wow. much <laughs> and i'm imagining being at the grocery store and it's like this thing i made and it's like oh here's the oreo cookies and it's like oh yeah i guess i remember getting a like a, a check from the best like the dog this. is famous from the show yeah it goes on tours <laughs> yeah and it's like this is a show where at one point a guy is torturing a man and cuts his penis off and mails it to his father and instant hit and we <laughs> and somehow became the the official tv show of oreo cookies <laughs> children's wild favorite board, wild board. Like, the, the founder uh, didn't see that one coming <laughs> it has to feel so strange i think the question of like creating in that environment how are you able to do it because stephen king seems to navigate it effortlessly um well, he just all doesn't the many care. 
<laughs> well, but, but <laughs> okay, no but shit. is that true? Well, I'm not. I, uh, right. I'm, yeah, I'm definitely exaggerating. But uh, I mean, he did, like. Are you, do you follow Stephen King on Twitter? I he eventually got too political for me. I, I still right. follow him. I believe I may have muted him. Stephen King, if you're watching <laughs> this, I have not muted you. That was a joke I made. If, if you want to, to all of our podcasts. collaborate on something, right. please no, don't I think take that this would be as a fantastic collaboration. Don't take this as a sign that I'm disrespecting you. But yeah, back to the show. I absolutely stopped reading because I just get sick of the like like the first eight million times I heard somebody say Trump was was a scumbag. I, I was on board, but at some point it's like, okay, let's move on to, I'm not on here for that. Right. I, 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 I mean, give me, yeah. give me something else. Um, I'm not following you specifically for that. I want your books or whatever, you know? Uh, right. And again, it took, please, Stephen King, if you're out there, <laughs> you have every right to type whatever you want into your Twitter. That's the magic of Twitter. You have every right to, I'm not saying stick to writing. I'm not saying just, I would never say to an athlete, stick to sports. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that. I also have the right to mute your account because it's just not what I'm in the mood for. Right? So anyway, to, back to the question. Totally. Uh, yes, I followed him on Twitter. Absolutely. But I may have missed some of his recent tweets. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, he he definitely he, he gives off an air. And he, he, there's a really good conversation between Stephen King and George R. R. Martin uh, on YouTube. It's it's a it's got a lot of views. It's a very famous conversation. Um, that's the one where George R. R. Martin asks, uh, like, how do you write so many fucking books? You know, oh right uh, yeah uh, it's like a famous question now um but yeah it's uh writing you know because i feel like stephen king is so he's saturated in a in a really different way than george r, r. martin is like he had like this kind of slow um since the 70s popularity that's just been it, it had grown for a long time and it it had kind of like seeped into americana in a way that Martin's was very much more like explosive and like everybody looking at him at the same time. Um, so like writing for Martin, I imagine, you know, like when Stephen King comes out with a new book, he's got his, his audience. And if it's a really good book, then a lot of people read it. And if it's not, then his, his audience likes it. And then nobody really like, nobody has this expectation of Stephen King to put out the next greatest fantasy book ever written which i mean he just he did just put out a really good fantasy book but that's beside the point but with martin it's like the the second that he publishes that book a million people are going to hate it like he there's no way of getting around it like there's just mm -hmm. it could be a perfect book and still he's going to have to deal with people uh, a, a horde a wave of people being disappointed in it so that that must be where a lot of that pressure is coming from. It's just that explosive nature and popularity leads to incredibly high expectations of somebody that I, I honestly, I mean, as as an amazing of a writer as Martin is, I I don't think he's going to hit the mark. Like, well, yeah, just... especially since there's this other alternate version of it to compare it to, because right. now I know for a fact that when people read my book. And when there's a part with Daenerys, I now know they have a face they're picturing right. of this specific right. actress who was cast in the show. Well, well, that's not what she looks like in his head. That's not what any of these people look like in his head. He's got his own visual picture, but the people who were cast in the show, like in the cultural imagination, no, that person looks like whatever. It looks like this. It looks like this, this actor. So that's right. part of it that also... What you touched on, like Stephen King turning around, like writing something outside of his genre, writing this fantasy story. Mm -hmm. Here's where I do think that the noise and the everything around him at some point did influence him. Because early on, Stephen King, mm -hmm. he is not, there's nothing about him or his personality where it's like, I want to write horror. I want to be a horror author. When he was starting out, he had several things in mind and his agent, because I think it was there was Carrie and Salem's Lot, and I actually don't remember which one came first. Carrie. But like Salem's Lot, when he wrote that, it originally had like a bunch of footnotes and endnotes about like the history of like the vampire legends and stuff like that. Like he says, in my mind, I was writing Moby Dick. I was writing the Moby Dick of vampire stories. It's so cool. It was supposed to be this heavy, like academic, thoughtful, like important award winning uh -huh. book that happens to be about vampires. So the idea that, and then it was when they were immediately going to follow up with, I think, Carrie, 
And his agent said, now, you know, if you do two best-selling horror novels, you're now a horror author. And like, he's like, we were taking a walk in New York and had this conversation. And he's like, I think I'm okay with that. But that was a conscious decision because you look like his short story collections or when he did the Richard Bachman stuff, there's crime stories in there. There's like, it's not all horror. And I think to some degree, or you look at JK Rowling turning around writing these crime novels under a pseudonym and trying to like create a separate persona for herself because she just doesn't just want it to be endless wizard stuff um, or her or her ter- saying terrible things on Twitter that she wants to to break out of that genre. I, I think that's where in those early days when Stephen King went from being this struggling part-time school teacher or whatever he was, you know, university teacher, whatever he was doing at that time, when suddenly Carrie became a monster, monster runaway bestseller and shortly after that became a movie, hit movie. Um, I don't doubt that back then in the 70s, his life was turned upside down. And then when he sat down to write the next book, it had to have weighed on him. Oh, wow. I'm now not just reaching into my imagination to tell a story. I am now a corporate brand producing a product. Then now people expect something of it. Now, 50 years into it, yeah. he probably has it down. He's probably got an extremely gone to an extremely healthy place where he understands, you know, I, I have freedom to do something weird and to do different right. things, to do to do some crime stories and all that. But I bet early on, I, I would probably, if I had dinner with him, I would probably ask, what was what was it like back in 1978, 1979? What was it like right. when you were, you went from being just this guy to where you're being interviewed in every magazine and to where your name is this brand, is this massive brand to where they're making blockbuster movies. And at one point, and he's on so much like cocaine at the time. I would have asked him, <laughs> yeah. was that a coping mechanism? Oh, were sorry. you on the- Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The, the drugs, because like the schedule you were keeping, you're talking about how you're writing 20 straight hours with Kleenex stepped up your nose because you're you're bleeding. Your nose is bleeding. Ugh. And so you're sitting there writing, writing, Chief writing. Paul Mall. Oh, my like, gosh. Just... Um, and the fact that he survived that is is great. A lot of people Insane. in that situation don't. But that he was he had to have felt, if I don't keep the pedal to the floor, I won't be able to stay ahead of this right such a long-winded answer to a simple question i really really like that conversation though it's it's i mean if if we had six more hours i would i would entertain it because it, <laughs> it is endlessly fascinating so thank you for your input on that two questions one for the listeners that's more of a um, uh, like logical one and then another one that's just kind of for me because i think it's fun one how important is it in your mind that your that your um new book listeners your new book readers read all of your previous books the three before this one that's coming out and then two if there's one scene excuse me in these books that kind of embodies the whole story like for me it's the end of book two with the car flying through the gate blasting bad moon rising like classic wonderful i'll i just have that in a very special place in my mind so what's that scene for you Okay, um, so I actually forgot the first question. Of course, of oh, how important I was trying is to it think to of... read the first uh, three books? Oh, uh, not at all. These are okay. not serialized in in any way. It's that is by design. I want you to be able to come in wherever you want. For example, the the one like the New York Times bestseller was the second one. This book is full of spiders. That probably is the fan favorite of all of all the series. Is book two. Um, and that's fine. I, I I I don't care. And if you if anyone listening to this has picked up book three and said, well, I started reading it, but it was extremely confusing because everything is weird. I'm telling you, reading the first two won't won't it's help just that. Weird. It's just right. the way they are. Like they 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 reintroduce the world as well as it's going to get as it ever is introduced, right. and then it each one ends. These do not end on a cliffhanger. If it's it's not this thing where you're. I was like, well, I'll wait till he finishes the series and I'll sit down right. and read them all. Which is so a this common one thing continues people say. the trend of it being its own standalone. Yes. And piece. and, okay, cool. and always will. The Zoe novels are the same thing. There's two of mm-hmm. them. If you want to pick up on Zoe too, uh, that is fine. It will it will catch you up to speed. It's not an ongoing. It's not an ongoing series because. So you should start at one if Zoe. <laughs> I um, I don't think I 
could write that way. I can't imagine turning in a book that like ends on a cliffhanger and then writing the book with the pressure, especially when you're out in the ecosystem of social media and you see fans speculating Ooh, yeah. and that thing of like, well, they've kind of guessed that twist. So I bet it, I'd better change it. Oh boy. Ooh, because I see people on that. Reddit yeah. have, have, no, never. It, it will be, it will be finished. And if you say, well, but Jason, that's how you wrote it the first time. It's like, yeah, but that was, it was like, uh, t- 26 people on my message board it wasn't a right. worldwide thing where people everywhere it was it was a few friends i was writing it for you know it, that's why it served as like my writing school because i was able to figure out how to write books in real time and see the free their feedback and see the traffic and and kind of figure out how to do this because again i had never written a book before um at this point no i want each book to be a complete package i i my dream is that if you stumble across any of these books but they're goofy titles and you're, or you're at a used bookstore and you see this, this battered paperback called Zoe punches the future in the dick. And that makes you chuckle and you pick it up. I want you to be able to open the first page and it draws you right in. It catches you right right up and that you then can't put it down until it's over. And then obviously, you know, I, I only am able to pay the mortgage if if you then go buy the other books. <laughs> go buy more of them, but, yeah. But these days, if somebody comes to me and recommends like this great, oh, this great series, there's 27 books, but you got to start from the start, the beginning. It's like, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. I've got, I've got yeah. a list of books I bought on my Kindle that I've not read yet. I've got like $200 worth of books in there that I've bought and I've not started. So to it's everyone- these books are good enough. You should start with the first one because they are very good. And it that would is, and you read them all. Yeah. <laughs> and read them all. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but it's but I would never in this day and age is that is so much to ask right. that you know when now you're you better catch up reading the first three books because book four is coming. You no, know, it's only book four in the sense that th- there are three others that exist. You can start, you can read them in any order. And as I always say, if you do start with like book book three or book four. Um, and then you circle back and you notice that one of those early books has a character that was conspicuously absent from the later books. <laughs> you probably can probably extrapolate that character does not maybe does not survive the book. Right? <laughs> so that maybe that will act as a spoiler, but it's not a thing yeah. where it's picking up in, in midstream. And that would be so to try to write that way. As again, uh, many authors do fantasy authors do it, or, you know, um, I I couldn't I wouldn't be able to handle it. That's why all my questions to George R. R. Martin be about like like the stress of like how do you you make yourself create something? It, it's I think once it got to be big enough to where like the whole world is waiting for it, they're all waiting to see how the cliffhanger ended. Oof. I I couldn't do it. I, I I I yeah I couldn't. And this the like having a responsibility to finish the story because it's like well what if i have health problems or right, what if i just yeah, can't you know right. something comes up or is a tragedy in my life and i'm not able to finish the series that would suck i feel like i owe people an ending so no if you paid the money you're going to get a complete story hopefully a satisfying ending that ends that saga in their lives and then you know if it well, if if you read the next book it's because you enjoyed it enough you want to go read the next book it's not because i deprived you of an ending <laughs> and you now have to read it to see whether or not this character survived i don't it's not again nothing wrong with that if if you write that way it's fine it's just i don't it would be putting too much pressure on myself and that's just not my thing i appreciate um, the full and complete work also so uh, iconic scene i want to hear your scene of scenes and don't include this new book obviously well it's i do like the one you mentioned but i think probably the scene from that i mentioned earlier from the opening book where they confront the the monster and then the way they have to ultimately resolve it is to get him just get him on the phone with with this other guy and then the you, meat and monster then, it sums all of it up really well yeah and yeah. they they kind of are like waiting because it breaks the whole deal is it breaks every rule of storytelling that any decent writer follows where the characters have to have agency and it's they have to have like you know it has to be their own cleverness that, that got them through this and all mm-hmm. that and then i if i wanted to sound smart I would say, well, yeah, but the the theme of these books that these people feel like they are not in control of the situation or of their own lives, and that the way they resolve their first challenge you see them encounter 
is that they just had to defer to a grown up to call an expert to fix to fix it for them somebody who actually knows what he's doing and that and they they wind up just kind of like waiting on the side while this thing is on this demon is on the phone with this other guy and they're they can't hear the conversation um and, and hear what he does that 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 resolves it it's like that's the joke but it's not just it's not just stupid or unexpected. It fits with their their situation. But I I like that as and in the in the movie, and they built a great costume, a meat meat costume for the guy. But in the movie, the the performer in the costume does this great thing where they hand him the phone, and he's again he's made of just just meat from from a meat freezer, <laughs> and he like does the thing where he turns he like leans away and like the way you do with with a phone call that is supposed to be private. He like turns like does this. And it's great because it's like this monster, but it, the mannerism is this familiar thing of like you're not they the grown ups are going to have a conversation and you're now waiting helplessly waiting for them to finish it. <laughs> so I would probably go with that more than any of the other of the big action beats. What what you reference is a scene where they to get into this compound he has to he doesn't drive through the great gates he has to ramp his way in, um, but it's something that is. It's set up and foreshadowed long before that. They keep referencing ramping things, and then suddenly it happens. And it's to spoil it. It's it's a an especially stupid moment, but also it's certainly oddly a crescendo. Uh, yeah, but it's but it's another case where his plan is terrible, but it's also kind of inspiring that he tried it anyway. But I want to ask one more question and then kind of wrap this up. Is that okay with you, Jason? Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I asked this question of every author that we have on here. Uh, I'm a budding writer, and a lot of other people that are listening to this are. And this is a, I'm, you know, you said before that you hadn't been asked that question, but I, I guarantee you've been asked this one. So I appreciate you uh, entertaining it. Um, is there any advice besides, uh, you know, developing social media skills or a platform on social media as far as the fingers to keyboard? alone in a room writing process is there any advice that you would give writers that are starting out or uh, actively writing books i would say that don't tie your value of writing or your the way you value the act to sales or money or popularity or anything else if you sit down and write it thinking this is going to be the book that that makes me famous. This is a book that's going to allow me to write full time, or this is going to be, I think that is creatively a very bad place to start because I think if you have the thought that like, well, you know, like dark fantasy does really well right now, I'm going to write a dark fantasy story or, or, or YA, like YA vampire stuff is really hot right now. Probably not true, but it was, um, it was, yeah. And if you find yourself, or it's like, well, apocalyptic YA fiction, that's you know, Hunger oh, Games yeah. type stuff. It's huge right now. And it's like it, to try to like gauge the market or to try to think in terms of, because on TikTok, there's a ton of writer advice, very well-meaning. And a lot of it is on like what's selling right now or what's right. what's what's breaking Keyword through agents writing. Right, right now. And I think your first audience for the book is you. Because if you don't find the story compelling enough or interesting enough, you're not going to finish the book. It takes an unbelievable amount of energy, psychological, emotional, physical stamina to finish a book. This is why very, very, very few people do it. A lot of people start books. Many, many people start books. Very few people finish them. So I think you have to approach it as in the beginning it is just me and the book and the rest of the world doesn't exist. I'm not, I'm writing this book the way I would write it. If I were alone on a desert Island, just trying to write the most amazing striking, beautiful thing with the thought that maybe someday a sailor will wash up to this Island and find a skeleton under a tree clutching this book and he will read it and it will touch him. That you don't, that you're not sitting there writing it with the audience in mind. Like, you know what? The the 15 year old girls I'm aiming at at this will love it if (laughs) this happens, or they will really, this is going to blow their socks off if if I make it so that it turns out that, you know, that also her her, uh, brother's also a vampire. Um, That you, instead of trying to think of it that way, that you kind of put the career stuff aside and try as hard as you can to write it 
if it only exists, if it's only going to exist as a thing that only you and maybe your friends um, and maybe a few people online or whatever have read that you're proud of, because the odds are overwhelming that that's what it's going to be. And I'm not trying to be discouraging. It's just that when you walk into a bookstore, if those of us in the biz, uh, there's a, a week or so ago, there's an article that went around where during, because they're doing this uh, merger of the last few remaining publishers are going to, I guess, just eventually yeah. become one giant publisher. And there's an antitrust uh, lawsuit against that happening. And they've had to reveal a bunch of their stats. And one of the striking numbers that came out was what a huge percentage of, of books only sell a few hundred copies. Wow. Yeah. And I think ultimately what the the stat that I saw, I think yesterday, because the people are trying to parse what it means, is that I think the, the main publisher is something like 60% of the titles they put out sell fewer than a thousand copies. Wow. And when you walk into a bookstore and you see all those books at Barnes and Noble or whatever, the vast, vast majority of the books on the shelves, uh, the number of titles on the shelves, like, like the number is skewed by the fact that they have, you know, 900 copies of, of this Colleen Hoover book or, or whatever, but I'm saying uh, the number of titles on the shelves, the vast, vast majority are, are written by people who are doing it part-time or as a hobby. Yeah, They have full-time jobs as professors in college or creative writing teachers or whatever, and they will write a book or the reporters or journalists, right? Um, and they'll knock out a book and maybe it sells a few hundred or a few thousand copies. And that's fine. It, the, the most of those books exist because people did it on the side the number of people like me who are able to do it full-time is very small. And when you look at what I had to do in order to arrive at this spot, you realize it only emphasizes how crazy it was. I had to give this book away for free on the internet for about five straight years and then went through the self-publishing route and then went through a small uh, print-on-demand publisher, uh, the great permuted press who took a chance on it. And then when only a few thousand physical copies existed on all of planet Earth, one of them wound up in the hands of Don Coscarelli, a, a famous horror writer, director, producer, wow. who didn't just want to make it a movie, but actually got it made. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, Lots of people sell thing. the film yeah. rights to their book. The fact that it actually got made and then debuted at Sundance and became a cult hit, all of those were million to one, sh- one shots. If you relive my life a thousand times, it probably happens Nine nine hundred ninety nine times it doesn't happen this way. So only through that extreme good fortune, and then me then turning around and spending tons and tons of time, like on the internet, working on the internet, working for a huge internet publication, cracked at one point had twenty five million readers, listeners, watchers a month. Um, and then I, I was lucky enough to get that job. And so I helped sell that helped me sell books, right? Because it kept me visible. I was able to right. link the books at the end of my columns for this, you know, this big company that had hired me to, to edit their website. So I had that advantage. It's just advantage on top of advantage on top of advantage It's good luck on top of good luck on top of good luck. And even then I still had a day job until two years ago. And didn't leave it willingly. And basically they had to pivot away from my, like my job was going to be irrelevant there. Um, And and I did that. If it was up to me, I would still be working there or somewhere similar because I always wanted the books to be something I did on the side because I never wanted a thing to be where how this next book sells dictates whether or not I'm allowed to keep writing books. I wanted to be a thing where I don't care. I've got a day job. Um, So, even I was only doing it part time, you know, for for the first forty five years of my life. It was only, you know, it was only in twenty twenty um, that I, at age forty five, that I finally became a full time full time author. I mean, yeah, so, the year that you published your book was the year that you started working for Cracked, right? Two thousand seven was when John Dice came out, and when you said you started working for Cracked. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I actually got the 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 movie deal and the the job at Crack. Those things came within like three weeks from each other. I was working wow. at an insurance company prior to that. So it, if you had found me at age thirty two, I was just working in a cubicle, entering insurance claim information as my day job, and then blogging on the side, and then writing this horror novel on the side. And so after the movie deal came in, then I got the book deal after that with with uh, McMillan, St. Martin's Press, and imprint of McMillan, and to everything took off from there. But the but I, the point I'm trying to make is I gave away my work for free because not just this book, but all the stuff I was writing on that blog. 
you know, I ran that for a decade before I got ever got a paying job from it. I put thousands and thousands of pieces of writing, essays and columns and all of the stuff I put out into the world completely for free. And, and you you add up all of my hundreds of thousand, you know, tr- Twitter posts and the TikTok. It's all for free. It's all free work that I did just to get enough eyeballs to be able to sell you know, and I'm not selling millions of books. It's it's you know they're yeah. and to sell enough to to pay back the advance that lets me pay my pay my mortgage. That's how long I had to toil doing it, doing all that unpaid work to get to where I am now. So I feel like if you are used to authors you've seen in movies where they get the big book deal and then that's it. Now they're a full time author and now they've bought the big house and they're going to like cocktail par- parties with their agent. I don't know if those parties actually happen. I, I don't live in New York, but <laughs> but where they get the big book deal, I was like, okay, now I'm a writer from now on. Right. And then it's always some adventure where this writer is like drunk and struggling with writing their second book or whatever. That is such rare air that you should put it out of your mind. You cannot, if you're setting out to write your book purely with the thought of this is going to make me a full-time writer, I think you will be so suffocated by that that you'll find it difficult to write a good book that's not just something that's uniquely you. Um, Because I think if you're doing it right, every minute you're typing it, you should be like, this is so weird. Nobody's going (laughs) to. Because my thing was written as a prank on the reader. The whole joke was that you would get mad by like, this person wasted my time. It's like, this is stupid. This is stupid. You know, but, and so I, I never, pitched a book to an editor. I've never queried an agent. I don't know what that is. I've never written a cover letter. I, I've not done any of that stuff. I wrote it on the internet. I self-published it. It got made into a movie. And then they had to like say, like, who's your who's your agent? Like, we want to pick this up and make it a real book with a hardcover release. And I was like, well, I don't I don't have it. Where how do you find an agent? Like, where is that? Like I live in a small town Google, in Illinois. Uh... Where do you <laughs> Like, I'm not friends with, I, I don't work in the industry. I wasn't like an, I didn't work my way up from being like an editor or, or a reviewer or anything. I don't, I'm not a real writer. I'm just a guy who wrote a bunch of stuff on the internet. I'm not, I'm not an actual writer. I'm just a, I'm just a guy. Um, and then from there, I had to go find an agent from there. I had to go work backward Yeah, wow. and, and give the, the publisher like, well, here's this thing. You know, uh, we, it's been copy edited, but it's never, I had never worked with an editor The you know, the version I put out there was just, they, you know, they reformatted it and they did a copy edit it and, and went through and, um, it told me some legal issues that had to be addressed that it had, I had never gone through. So like, for example, in, in a movie, they like write the book with their editor or with their agent. They're like talking, they're like drinking with their editor and hashing out story stuff. Is that how it works? Do other authors work that way? And they're all like friends with their agents. Am I supposed to be best friends with my agent? (laughs) Is that a thing in real life? I I don't, uh, I don't know. I legitimately don't know because it's like the, the movie, the book, uh, the movie misery. And it's like, He's in the when they're discussing after he gets away from from the crazy lady and and James Conn's character is like discussing his new book with his agent in this high rise in New York. Like, is that how they do it? It's because I talk to my agent like once every two years. Everything else is just <laughs> once a, every two it's, years. It's like a, t- a terse email. I've it's I've seen him in person one time because he happened to be like traveling through through the same city I was in, but. Uh, the the point being that nothing about how I thought it worked is how it works. So I feel like if you've grown up with pop culture's idea of what it's like to be a successful author or whatever, I don't, I'm not sure that actually exists for anyone. So I would have the same advice for somebody who wants to be a musician. Like I, your goal, should be to get really, really good at making music and then making music that you're proud of or that, you love listening to or that touches people and then worry about how to build a following after that. Because if you're making it with a thought of, Oh, this will be like to be able to, they'll be able to pull this hook and and play it on TikTok. This would be a good TikTok hook. Yeah, I don't think you right. can create that way. At least I don't think you can create stuff. You're, you're going to be proud of that way. Interesting. Wow. That's really excellent advice. That's really good advice. It was very similar to what Josiah Bancroft said too. His uh, answer, he was the writer of the books of Babel. 
a fantasy series that we just finished on the podcast. And he was very much focused on ways that write your book that will inspire you to write your book because it was, he spoke of the difficulties of uh, finishing and, and the great uh, actual feat that is completing a, a book as well. So that's interesting that your advice was on long, similar lines. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate that advice. Uh, and I know that our listeners do too. I'm sure our listeners appreciate this entire conversation with you. It's been really yes. illuminating. It's been one of my favorite interviews that we've ever done on here. I really appreciate your time. Um, I appreciate your work too. I mean, these books are, in my opinion, and, and uh, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but they are very wholly unique on my shelf and I'm happy to have them there. Absolutely. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, the title of the new one, if we're plugging it. Yeah, plug it. Plug, <laughs> plug, plug, plug. plug. If this book exists, you're in the wrong universe. It is part of a series. If you have never heard of me before, and if you never heard of the series before, doesn't matter. You can you can start with this one. Or the other ones are probably much cheaper. They're probably oh, yeah, your library. Yeah. You can probably get them for free. So if you want to start for, with them because it's less expensive, that's also fine. But the otherwise, names of every one of your books will be in the description. So everyone, um, uh, just look in the description. They're all. But there. Otherwise, you can get it anywhere they sell books. Uh, it's an audio with ebooks, or unless, unlike the grocery store, it, I'm not famous enough to have books at like Safeway, you know, in the rack <laughs> and the, the one stand they've got for like they've got the Tom Clancy books and all that. It's it, it would have to be John like Grisham. an actual an actual bookstore or or a, a Barnes and Noble, but anywhere you buy books, if you can buy it from a brick and mortar store, please do. Absolutely, they are suffer suffocating. These stores mm -hmm. are um, any kind of any bookshop, but hey. Barnes and Noble is also dying. If you can buy it there, <laughs> that also will help. The the concept of physical bookstore is a thing that was so key to so many of us who love books and a physical place where you can go and browse and be among other other quiet book people. It's so special, and they are dying. The the pandemic hit a lot of businesses. It obliterated brick and mortar bookstores oh even amazon and amazon had to shut down their stupid bookstores amazon i'm not calling you stupid <laughs> i love your company and i i'm proud to uh to have your books on your platform um but even they had to shut down their brick and mortar like Am amazon, amazon like wow. this yeah. was the amount of money they were spending on that project had to have been like a rounding error like right. they, they couldn't have even <laughs> yeah. had to have been nothing compared to the, but even they were like we gotta shut this good down. luck this does not work uh, selling selling books in a physical building what what kind of a, a pervert would want to do that <laughs> uh so please if you can get out uh and buy it from a physical bookstore if you're hearing this if this show comes out prior to release if you pre-order it all you gotta do is go up to the counter and tell them the name of the book they may chuckle at the title but they love it when you pre-order stuff there they they are very very happy to secure those orders uh i know for a fact from seeing the sales figures that 90 some percent of you will not do that you order it online <laughs> the same way i buy all of my books that's fine uh because i'm an ebook reader i all my books are on kindle i've i i've gotten into that habit um but if you can please support your local bookstores um and i i've i try to do that <laughs> Uh, I don't do it enough. I, I I should. I'm a hypocrite. I, I should spend more at my local stores. Some all? of them, especially here in the city, have been very, very good to me. Uh, in here in Nashville, Parnassus Books, we've done a pre-order book promotion where they I told them I would sign any of the pre-orders they got. And so far they have, I think, 1,100 orders they've gotten in that I have to go oh, sign. Wow. Someday. wow. A lot of signing. Um, yes. Uh, I've never signed that many of anything, uh, yeah, except yeah, for when we did like hand. the the mortgage of our house, I think there were about that number of sheets to the form, but otherwise I've not, I don't know that I can sign that many of a thing in one day. We will find out, but. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being on this podcast. We really, really appreciate your time. We know that you're busy and everybody listening. Thank you for being here and go check out this new book. It's called, if this book exists, you're in the wrong universe and take it from me and Chad. It is excellent. Jason, yeah, and go really follow appreciate Jason on here. TikTok and Twitter. Yeah, just and search my name. Just search the name Jason Pargin on TikTok. It's Jason K Pargin. P A R G A G I N is how we're spelling that last name. But also on any other social media platform, the odds are I'm I'm on it, unless it's one of the brand new ones that I still not heard of yet. Go follow uh, Jason on Truth Social, everybody. I'll put as Truth many of the links in the description as I can find, especially his one for uh, Truth Social. 
Anyway, uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We really appreciate you being here. And of course, Jason, thank you so much for your time. And of course, happy reading, folks. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jason. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.